And I was saying before I start, I spent last evening on a tractor trailer in the middle of a field with cows listening to a discourse on um, farming. I was frozen, absolutely frozen. And I tell you, I got into bed last night, I had the old blanket on full blast. <laughs> anyway, by the by, good morning, everyone. For members of the public, I'm Pauline Grove Jones and I chair this committee. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to ask the officers to present themselves. I'll start on my left. Good morning. My name is Jeff Lyon. I'm the development manager at Northampton. Uh, hello, my name is Russell Stock and I'm a team leader in the development management. Hello, good morning. I'm Lauren Gregory. I'm Democratic Services Officer. Good morning all. My name is Philip Rosen. I'm the Assistant Director of Planning here at North Norfolk. Chairman, I'll need to give my apologies around about 10.30. I'll be called to another meeting. Okay, that's right. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Joseph Barrow and I'm a Senior Planning Officer here at North Norfolk. Thank you. And on my right, oh, Fiona Cruxon, um, a legal advisor to the council. And these officers will um, offer technical advice and present our reports. In front of me, I have my committee all sitting here looking eager to start. Um, and they'll be making the decisions on the items on the agenda. Um, and before we start, can I just ask if you do have mobile phones, to turn them to silent or off. And if you hear the alarms go off, I know the alarms have been altered, but I don't think it's today. No, it's the real thing, the fire alarm. So just follow the exits and watch where the officers send you. Don't use the lift and assemble in either the front or behind this main building. Um, and if we go on for long, longer than 11 or so, we can have a small break for coffee and facilities are available just outside here at the end of the foyer. Um, welcome to the public. Nice to see you. And we will now go to uh, receiving apologies for absence. Lauren, please. Thank you, Chairman. Apologies for absence have been received from Councillor Andreas Yassini, Councillor Angie Fitch Tiller, and Councillor Adam Varley. Thank you. Any substitutes? There are no substitutes on the chain, uh, occasion, Chairman. Yeah. We are supposed to have substitutes, I understand. Unfortunately, the members were unable to source substitutes, and some of the apologies for absence were quite last minute. Okay. Of course, this does diminish the amount of people who are here to make a decision. So there we go. That's one of those things. Now, the minutes of the last meeting, pages one to 10 of your agenda. I'm making the assumption that you've looked through them. And if there are any corrections, can you please let me know now? Otherwise, if everything's okay, can I have someone to prove, Richard? Kershaw and Peter Fisher seconding. Do we have a hands for approval? Thank you. Any items of urgent business, Lauren? There are no items of urgent business. Thank you. Order of business will be as it stands. Um, and declarations of interest, pecuniary or non-pecuniary, basically pecuniary, yes. Um, well, I've got a tentative financial interest in item eight, and I've been advised um, because members of the public can take part in the debate, so can I, and I can vote. You That's can. all right with you. I can yes, vote. Thank yes. you, ma'am. Chair, yeah, likewise, yeah. Uh, from my point of view as well, same right. situation. Right. Okay. Anybody else got anything for the Bacton one? No? Okay. So we now go to um, pages 17 to 48, Bacton, PF forward stroke 21, forward stroke 1878, proposed ground mounted solar photovoltaic array, and I'll pass to, um, oh, Chris, which is not here. Sorry, you're going to do it, Russell. <laughs> the Russell stop is going to present. Thank you, Chairman. 
Yeah, so I'll just uh, introduce this application. So as you've just said, it is um, an application for the installation of ground-mounted solar photovoltaic array, um, along with um, a transformer. The proposal would generate 1,238 megawatt hours of electricity per year um, and would account for about 12% of the applicant's current on-site em energy usage at um, Bacton Gas Terminal. Um, at the time that the agenda was published and as set out on page 39, the proposed pre-commencement conditions were yet to be agreed. Uh, agreements to these conditions have subsequently been um, achieved um, and the applicant confirmed this on the 20th of September. Um, I just to draw members' attention to sort of following discussions with the Highway Authority, the recommendation is updated slightly to, to include an additional condition to ensure that glint and glare impacts upon larger vehicles, such as HGVs, has been fully considered and mitigated if, if deemed necessary. And it is asked that delegated authority be given to the assistant director to agree the final wording of this condition. Um, a, a following the publish of the agenda, um, a few questions have arisen, um, and I thought it'd be helpful just to clarify that the 12% figure um, used and set out within the agenda um, relates to uh, it's, it's to the solar project proposal is to replace 12% of the power currently supplied to the Shell gas backed and terminal from the national grid. Um, page 22 of the agenda highlights that officers were aware of an online petition in objection to the proposed development. A link to this change.org petition has subsequently been received. This petition now has, has been signed by 580 people, and the basis for the petition reflects the objection matters summarised on pages 21 to 23 of the agenda. So the recommendation is for approval subject to the conditions set out within the report and for delegated authority to agree the final wording of that additional condition relating to glint and glare and any others to be deemed necessary by the Assistant Director of Planning. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Um, I now go to the town and parish. Don't think we have anybody here, uh, but we do have an objecting speaker, um, Mrs. Hollis. You have three minutes, Mrs. Hollis, from the time that you turn. We'll tell you when your three minutes are up. We are owners of Castaways Holiday Park, which is a static caravan park, hotel, apartments, lodges and public house with over 700 higher bed fleets. We acknowledge the climate changes facing our planet and the need to increase sustainability of our energy for production in the UK. The large solar farm next to our business relies on the surrounding natural environment to attract visitors, is proposed to be highly sensitive, therefore inappropriate location. The proposals represent a genuine threat to the continued existence of our business, both through the loss of natural buffer to the built up gas terminal site and the impact of glint and glare caused by solar panels as confirmed in the applicant's own assessments. The loss of the business will have considerable impact on the economy and this part of the district as the result will removal income generated by thousands of visitors to the holiday park over the course of the tourist season. For a review of the application documents and national local planning policies, we objected on the basis the proposal of development will cause harm to the countryside, cause harm to biodiversity, cause harm to residential amenity, endanger lives of people close to the gas terminal, increase risk of flooding nearby and result the loss of the best, the most versatile agricultural land. These material considerations reviewed either together or in isolation represent sufficient grounds for refusal of this application. This application is yet another cynical attempt by the operators of Bacton Gas Terminal to develop with own, only the buffer zone between the gas terminal and the village. Neither the original application, submission or revised proposals ensure the protection and enhancement of natural and environmental assets. As a result, the proposal is contrary to lo local plan policies SS1, SS2, EN3, EN7 and paragraph 158 of the MPPF. 
the proposed improvements to the footpath as part of the revised proposals together with the additional of the new car park in Bacton Village are further cynical attempts to secure distracting the council away from the proposed significant flaws, the unrelated solutions to the wider accessibility issue. Overall, we need renewable energy generation should not automatically override environmental protections, health and safety considerations and planning concerns of local communities. This site should remain entirely as a buffer zone as per the 1960s industrial boundary, which was defined in following a public meeting. Uh, public inquiry, excuse me. Uh, the revised proposals do not change the principle or make the development of this site any more acceptable. The landscape officer previously commented the site forms part of an important function of separating large scale industrial complex from Bacton Village. It's unclear how the revised proposals can now be considered acceptable by officers, especially considering the retention of only a relatively narrow gap, as well as the retention of incredibly intrusive security fencing. We maintain our position the development still does not require coastal location and continues to adversely impact on the open coastal character. It's clear that any proposals will... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you'd like to return to your seat. We have a supporting speaker on behalf of the... Ren Energy Limited, Mr. Baker. You also have three minutes, Mr. Baker, from the time you start speaking. The second one in his little face, I think. Good morning. My name's Damien Baker, and I'm Managing Director of Ren Energy, the appointed contractor for the installation of the proposed solar ground array. I'm speak to you, speaking to you amid an ongoing energy crisis and a more serious climate crisis which threatens coastal areas like this more acutely. The Bacton gas terminal supplies up to one third of the UK's gas. The solar project will provide 12% of the total power that is currently used on site that is currently provided from the national grid. It would free up electricity for use elsewhere at a time when demand is growing rapidly. It would be the first asset of this type to combine solar power with energy storage. Solar will provide clean and reliable energy and make it and make no doubt it will be a world leading project and be replicatable elsewhere in the world. The project is expected to generate 1.2 million kilowatt hours of electricity per year, equivalent to over 350 houses use. The proposed is aligned with the national planning policy framework, ambition to transfer transition to a low carbon future. There is desperate need to increase renewable energy in all of its opportunities um, available. The proposed scheme has been designed to create a balance between form, function and the surrounding landscape. The scheme is being presented to you with a recommendation um, for approval from the case officer with no te technical objections, including conservation and design, landscape, no objections subject to the imposition of conditions, environmental health, no object, no objections subject to conditions, national trail officer, no objections, highway authority, no objections subject to conditions, minerals and waste authority, no objections, historic environment service, no objections, environment agency, no objections, health and safety executive, no objections. Shell and Ren Energy have sought to improve the proposals in response to comments from North Norfolk District Council's planning consultation process and our own community engagement. We have listened to views and taken measures to address the concerns raised. The latest redesign proposes to re a reduced scheme and a more consolidated layout that retains a 60 metre wide portion of the existing open field to address what is seen as an important gap in development between the industrial complex and the village and respect the prevailing character of the landscape. Further improvement have been made by relocating mature planting against the immediate eastern boundary and the panels providing screening and an extensive native planting belt to be added. The development will have adequate earthing, including a 20% safety margin, and all cables will be subject to insulation resistant tests based on shell and international standards. The proposals will open up the perimeter of the field for use by the local community, as well as facilitating ramped access for disabled users and pushchairs alike. The proposal will increase biodiversity, create a new habitat and encourage wildlife. Overall, balancing concerns of the community, challenging government targets and the climate emergency, which North Norfolk District Council have announced, with the additional benefits of freeing up grid supplied electricity, this scheme should be wholeheartedly backed by this planning committee. Oh, well done. Look, exactly three minutes. Thank you. If you'd like to return to your seat. 
Um, the local member for uh, Bacton is Councillor Fredericks, who isn't here, but she has supplied a statement which um, will be read <coughs> out. Senior Manning, manager. Development manager. Oh, what? Development manager. Oh, development manager. I can never remember. I can never remember the titles. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the email from um, um, Councillor Wendy Frederick says, I welcome this opportunity for residents to give their views on Seagulls Field. It has been a long process to get to this point for many of them. As a local authority and, and councillors, we want to work with our fellow residents of North Norfolk and elevate their voices to be heard by decision makers. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one, of, one of the issues I had, I think, is probably going, has been addressed uh, with the anti clint I, I assume, because we've had this before, uh, Madam Chair, where, where the coating can be applied uh, to, to, to the latest solar panel, so that, that will mitigate that. Um, my other um, point I'd like to make, I, I, I noticed in, in some of the objectives that, that there's a unwanted attention from criminals. Now, can they often tell me if, if he's any experience of, of criminals damaging solar panels or any other arrays, or is this, I don't understand why this is, why they suspect criminals will be damaging these solar panels. And my last point is 78% um, of carbon reduction by 2035 surely is a good thing. So you, if you could maybe answer those questions for me. Thank you. Okay, in terms of have we got experience of other large solar farms suffering from criminal damage? And we've got over 150 megawatts of solar across this district already. I've not been sort of informed that we've had a significant issue of cables being stolen or any any, any other damage today. So I, I can't really sort of say yes, we've had we've had a problem in, in North Norfolk. It doesn't mean to say you won't have a problem in the future, but we've got no evidence to say that's that's a problem that needs a planning solution. Um, in terms of the other question about contributing to, to, to renewable energy. I mean, yeah, clearly this is a project that makes a, a significant difference to this site. And it's something that our policies support and the council would presumably support through the motion on the climate emergency. I now go to Council Holiday. Thank you, Chair. Um, it seems to me there's an awful lot of opposition from the community and um, the benefit is quite small. 12% of an energy use isn't, isn't huge. And I can't see the reason for having it in this particular location. And I don't agree with the assessment that it um, complies with many of our policies. I don't think it does. I don't think it complies with one, two, three, eight. I can't remember. Anyway, I don't agree with the assessment on the policy uh, concurrence. And um, I definitely think it should be somewhere else. If you, if you think you need a solar array, it shouldn't be on the undeveloped coast. And I think we should listen to our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Lloyd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just for clarity, the criminal aspect, the site does have, um, is protected by uh, armed, armed military of defence police um, who are there 24 seven, just to clear that one up. <laughs> um, I think it's a very comprehensive report. I'm aware that this has taken a while to come before us and um, I'd like to thank the applicants and officers for working um, so hard and being cooperative um, to bring this report to us today. Um, I also note that this is probably the longest set of conditions I've ever seen on a, on a I might be wrong, but um, I think just about everything that's and all the concerns that have been raised are controlled uh, with this application. The 12% energy use, um, it's actually a huge number. It might sound, 12% might not sound much, but trust me, um, that shell plant sucks a lot of energy out of the grid and a 12% is a huge amount of carbon that's saved from going to atmosphere. So I disagree with the last speaker. I know that there's actually net biodiversity gain. Um, it's disappointing with the skylarks, um, but the enhancements to bring other rare species, um, to attract other rare species to the land um, are valuable in my view. 
I looked closely at the glint and glare report um, and recognised that people were concerned. But um, what I see from the reports before us and those listed on the website are that all those issues have been addressed and that glint and glare will actually be um, because of the angles that the the, uh, the wind farm, uh, sorry, the solar farm has been uh, placed at. I also know that there's a significant buffer between this development and um, the nearest uh, caravan park. Um, that land um, ceased being agricultural. Of a, I can't remember, I can't give you a date, but it was a very long time ago. Um, and therefore we're not losing any agricultural land there. Um, the solar panels are quiet, unobtrusive, they're well shielded. Um, doubt very many people will actually notice they're there when once the um, the planting has taken place. Um, and I actually, I struggle to see any breaches of planning principle. Um, I think they've all been addressed and I don't see any grounds for objection. So I'm happy to propose this, Madam Chair, for acceptance. Thank you, Councillor Lloyd, for Dr. Jones' proposal. Um, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I have to say, this is the most comprehensive report, um, and I think it just exemplifies the situation we have transferring over to uh, renewable energy. We are going to need more and more renewable energy sites, whether you like it or whether we don't. And uh, I think it's a case of probably education to get people to come to accept them more readily whether that ever comes or not is another matter however as this is finally balanced i do see the comments and take most carefully as regards a neighboring business and what we've heard this morning there's no doubt i do think that they will suffer and uh, that will harm the economy locally so I'm not yet made my mind up. Um, I'm, I'm sitting like the scales of justice. I can see both sides of this. Um, and I just want to, the committee to note that I think this is going to show the way forward for other applications that are going to be cited uh, quite close to towns and habitats. And the other thing I will say is we all know the importance of the Bacton terminal is to the country. And uh, despite what, sorry about that, despite what's happened uh, elsewhere with gas pipelines in the, under the sea, we need Bacton, Bacton. So I'm leaning towards acceptance, but uh, it is with a very heavy heart. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Councillor Heinrich. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I suspect I might be the only person here who can remember that area of land before the terminal was built. I don't think shows my great age, I'm afraid, but I, I, I used to live, I used to live outside that side back. To, uh, yeah, it was an area of bleak open fields. And this is the last remaining one. However, we've got a very well argued and well structured report in front of us, which clearly says that we are not going to breach any of our own policies or any national policies uh, were we to uh, approve. And what we've got is a, a straightforward solar panel field, well designed, producing a significant amount of uh, solar energy, which these days is becoming increasingly critical. We cannot afford to carry on burning fossil fuels to produce electricity when there are other ways of doing so. I think the, the, the applicant has gone a, a long way to providing high quality landscaping and shielding around it. It doesn't significantly alter the view of the across across the land. If you use on that caravan park, you will still look straight across the gas site. And it has been for 40 odd, 50 years now. So it's a balance between a small lot of habitat, which is mitigated, and a small lot of land which is not in any way like to go back to agriculture. It is well screened. It'd like to be very well managed. Uh, 
I'm minded, minded to approve and I'm happy to uh, second the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hyman. Anybody else wish to speak before we go to a vote? Okay, so the proposal is to approve this application with recommendations as stated on pages 40 to 47. And as it's been stated, I think these are the most um, um, conditions I've ever seen on an application, which just shows how people, how the um, officers, etc., have considered this application. Um, and I will also uh, um, reiterate what an excellent report this this was very detailed um, for a difficult situation, a difficult application. So, um, Lauren, we're going to go to the vote, please, if you would do alphabetically. Yep. Councillor Brown? Four. Councillor Fisher? Four. Councillor Grave James? Four. Councillor Heinrich? Four. Councillor Holliday? Yes. Councillor Kershaw? Four. Councillor Lloyd? Councillor Mancini Boyle? Four. Councillor Pierce? Four. Councillor Taylor? Councillor Withington? That is 10 votes for, one against, the vote is carried. Right, and the proposer was Nigel Lloyd, and the second vote you've got that was Councillor Hines. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you. Thank you to the um, members of the public who have been in here. That's been carried. Right, we now go on to our second and final application on pages 49 to 53, I think, something like that, 53, 54. Um, Walcott, PF forward stroke 22, forward stroke 0738. And we have um, Officer Barrow to present. Barrow, I beg your pardon, Joe. Barrow and Borrow, goodness me. Thank you. Like to present the application, please. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Committee. Um, yes, the, the application before us is use of um, a parcel of agricultural land for a seasonal car park across the summer tourism season in, in Walcott. A slight correction over the description that's on the slide there. The agreed condition will commence from the start of May um, rather than June. Um, if we go through to the to the first slide, you will see the location plan there. It is to the western end of the Walcott Coast Road. Um, the L shape extension you'll see from the red line is an agreed additional access point, um, ensuring that we have um, one access point and one exit point onto the coast road at the request of the highway authority. Uh, there you will see uh, an aerial photograph better demonstrating that that's an approximate site location as best as I could sort of draw freehand when when preparing the presentation. You will see the site layout there i've counted the number of spaces this morning that is currently at 138 spaces that has been agreed with the um, the highway authority again as part of significant consultation that the agent has undertaken with the highway authority and, and negotiation. Um, and, and, and that's a layout that the Highway Authority deem acceptable. A crucial uh, point of assessment within this application has been the flood zone impact. Uh, flood zone 3B as part of our policy is areas of land which should be able to function as flood plain. You will note a small band to the north and east of the site which is within flood zone 3B. We've liaised with the Environment Agency twice and our own emergency planning team to ensure that they are all satisfied that there's no significant increase in risk to life. That is secured through responsible operation of the site. Um, the measures we already have in place to close Coast Road in the event of storm surges and bad weather conditions. And um, as well, um, there's no real land raising or land engineering works taking place in those locations. It's just the use of the land for the car parking. Flood zone 3A there, this is a less critical uh, constraint zone, but just gives you an idea that the majority of the site is not in flood zone 3A or 3B. 
just those areas to the north there. Um, so just looking at the access points as highways were, were quite critical um, and of initially of this access and trying to iron out all of the kinks that we could. Um, you'll note there that the booth just on the left hand side in behind the Batson sign, that's the access point of the car park. This is westbound moving up towards Batson. And the same view eastbound there, you'll see some of the cars just on the right hand side. This is, this is the agreed access point that we, we now have. And then the, the now confirmed uh, exit point for, for the car park there as well, looking west. So again, this is, this is part of the, uh, the highway consultations that we have agreed. And the same view across to the east, so you'll see where, where they would be able to, to emerge onto, onto the highway network there. So the overall recommendation is one of approval. There are a great many conditions there relating mostly to, to highway improvements, um, and, and those are recommended by, by the highway authority. Uh, there's some seasonal restrictions and opening hours restrictions as well on there. Um, and the trigger point for all of these conditions is to ensure that we have um, an imp improved, uh, in, improved proposal before us before operation in 2023. So we would be requiring that all of those all of those conditions are satisfied before 2023 is opening. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Jack. Um, we have um, Mrs. Porter from the T Parish Council. She's not here. Right, uh, we have no objecting speaker, but we do have uh, a Miss Rebecca Barringer, Mrs. Barringer, if you'd like to come up, please, supporting. Uh, who's the agent, I believe, is that right? Oh, right, well, we've got you down as agent, I do apologise. Um, you've three minutes from the time you start speaking, right. Good morning, committee members. My name is Rebecca Barringer, and um, the proposed piece of land is located on my family farm. We were approached by the Walcott Parish Council in 2018 when we were looking for a solution to the parking issues in Walcott during the busy summer months. We had a number of site meetings with the Parish Council who were very keen on this project as other village parking is limited or only occasionally open. After deciding that selling the land was not the correct option for the wider family farm, my husband and I decided to run the car park ourselves. As I'm an architect, I'm aware of any works that require permissions and so we submitted a lawful development certificate and contacted all the required authorities such as the environment agency and highways before we completed any works on the field. We ran the car park under permitted development usage for 56 days in 2021 and this summer for 28 days. By opening for previously the previous two summers using the permitted development rights we've identified the success and need for this project. We've had so many positive comments from tourists and locals alike. In 2021, as many of you will remember, we did not have the best summer. However, during the hot days, we could see the positive impact our car park was having on the seafront. We wanted the car park to become a community asset, and as such, we kept our parking fees lower than other places to cover our basic costs, such as setting up labour and insurances. We've always allowed members of the community to use the car park for events for free, so far, we've had a wedding car parking, uh, parking for a charity beach cleans, and most recently a uh, meeting for a funeral procession. We will continue to support events such as these and give back to the community where I grew up. People regularly have commented that they felt the car park has provided a safe place for children and animals to get out of the car, which is a worry for families parking on the busy main road. It also provides a place for people to unload large items like paddle boards. This year we had a much better summer and on busy days we had up to 100 cars on the field. Visitors from the car park mentioned they'd come from other areas of the coast that did not have enough parking. This increased numbers of visitors to the area and supported the local wider businesses, such as the pub, fish and chip shop and village store. We have proposed to only open the car park during the late summer months, some spring months and summer months, as it is just a grass field and it does get wet during the winter months. By keeping the field grass, we believe this has a minimal visual impact and will ensure that rainwater can infiltrate into easily, in, 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 if, so in case it wasn't hardcore. The increase in traffic to Walcock does only tend to be during the hot spring and summer days. So obtaining a full planning permission would ensure that we can be open during all the busy periods to make Walcott's seafront a safer place for people to enjoy. We hope you can all agree that this 
site provides a huge community benefit and can agree that we've obtained all the approvals from all the relevant authorities for this project to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Berenger. I'd like to sit down. Um, the local member is uh, Councillor Stockton, who I see is not here. Have we had a report? No. Yet again, I have to say, if you as a member, if members ask for a, an application to come to committee, we do expect, well, I expect, when, whilst I'm chair, that we either have a written report or the members turns up in person. Times this has been said, but anyway, let it be noted. Uh, so I'm, we now go straight to our members. Um, Richard. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am familiar with the site and uh, I did actually notice that it was used for a quite spectacular motorcycle funeral um, this summer. Um, for me, this is a busy, a busy part of the coast, but most of the problems with parking is people trying to find a parking space on the road. I, 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 I'm actually quite surprised this has been called before committee. I cannot see any issues with this. I think the owners are responsible. Um, the exit route is, is a sensible um, promotion. I think the, the, the village are in favour of it. it it's, it's a safe parking space where there has been a, a massive problem, so I'm happy to propose acceptance. Thank you, Councillor Kershaw. Um, Councillor Heinrich. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Somebody say this is a desperately needed facility in Walcott. It's in a perfectly acceptable location, well designed, well managed, served well during the summer. So I'm happy to second. Thank you, Councillor Henry. Councillor Withington. I'd just like to say it's it's it seems really good that we've got a project that's come forward here that seems very community based and with all the different organisations working together. Um, having been down there and on Backton Seafront trying to park, getting elderly people out of cars, etc., and dodging the people coming alongside you, I think it's very much needed. And will be hugely beneficial for the local economy. So um, I'm happy to second if nobody's already seconded. Yes, we have that, but thank you anyway. Um, Councillor Holliday. Thank you, ma'am. I take on board all the positive things that have been said, but I shouldn't we be discouraging people from driving along the coast? I mean, I thought we were a zero carbon council, and I thought a much better prospect would be to have car-free zones and people parking park and ride like we tried last summer i mean i think we should consider that because a long-term vision would be fewer cars and not more cars thank you thank you Councillor pierce thank you madam chairman car parks also arouse a little bit of controversy because uh if you look at it nobody really wants it but at the same time it's a need i'll take what councillor holiday has just said and the only thing that concerns me, not concerns me, I'd like to have answered if possible. If I look at the street view access, um, westbound, um, there's the picture. I see um, where we have the little shed. I don't know which page it is. Keep going. Uh, I, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. I notice where the shed is, there's a little incline um, that sort of uh it, it sits there i take it that's going to be for retention but uh, is the entrance wide enough to take a car going in and out at the same time onto that single lane highway it's just a question and i'm asking that question yeah it's in one way right okay but i'm so the car what about if a car wants to go in and a car wants to come out fine that's fine it, the, the, then it's sorted but uh, as i'm not a local there i'm only asking a, a, a question because i don't know the area as well as you um, that question's been answered. I think that uh, the other concern I had was the flood risk. And uh, I think anything that we can say is we can try and plan and mitigate for anything, but rainfall and seasonal temperature and weathers is beyond our control. We're well, not that good, but uh, unfortunately. But the situation is, I think, on the whole, it's a good project. 
thank you. Um, it's into the car park where the little booth is. And then if you follow your 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 um things here, that is the exit. So it's in and out separately. Um and, thank you, darling. And uh, the uh, we do know, uh, we are fully aware, those of us who live in proximity to Walcott, that it is prone to high tide flooding. So it, you know, it's one of those factors. Um, is that it now? I think anybody else want to speak? Okay. Um, Councillor Brown and then Councillor Mancini Royal. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would be quite happy to propose or second this if it hadn't already been done. So um, I think this is a scheme which is, is going to be of benefit to to the community. We've all been, well, most of us, I hope, have driven down that road and experienced the chaos sometimes in the high season that parked cars uh, present to, uh, to, to the motoring experience. I just wanted to, uh, what I would have liked to have seen in the uh, assessment from highways is a review of whether there should be more restrictions on parking on the road because this facility provides uh, parking in, in, in substitution, as it were. And also whether there are any parking restrictions, I presume there will be, opposite the entrance and exit to the car park to, to improve, obviously, manoeuvring. Um, but I, I welcome the, this application. Um, it will be a benefit, I'm sure, and I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Councillor Mancini Royal. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> yeah, it's a very good application. Uh, I agree with uh, Councillor Holliday in, in some points. Um, the question I would like to ask, which I, I assume has probably been possible, but would there be any um, in the future for electric charging points? I, I, I know it's in the middle of nowhere, and I suspect there's no electricity there, but maybe some wind um, turbine could be installed um, with electric charging points, because as we know, uh, Electric cars are on the up, and uh, places like this would be beneficial for people if there was electric charging points. Thank you. Can I just say something? I think the only place that the charging points would be um, would be sensible would be by the post office shop, that area there, where there's a little place where you can have something to eat, etc. I wouldn't suggest it for the field because uh, I mean it's only open during the summer. <laughs> You know, it could be closed off the rest of the time. So anyway, thank you for your uh, comments. Does anybody else wish to speak on this before I go to the vote? So if you go to page 55, the recommendation is to approve this um, and this application. Lauren, if you could have the alphabet to vote, please. Okay. Councillor Brown. Councillor Fisher. Councillor Grove-Jones. Councillor Heinrich. Four. Councillor Holliday. Four. Councillor Kershaw. Four. Councillor Lloyd. Councillor Mancini Boyle. Four. Councillor Pierce. Four. Councillor Taylor. Four. Councillor Withington. Four. That is unanimous, 11 votes for. Thank you. And that was with uh, Councillor Kershaw proposing and Councillor Heinrich seconding. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Don't ask me. Hey, I feel like I just kind of string this out to 11 o'clock, but I won't do. <laughs> okay, so I've attached uh, agenda item 10, uh, sort of the, the current sort of performance as it was up to the end of 31st of August. So I've got a table there showing the sort of the, the performance of the majors and non-major planning applications. Uh, whilst we didn't make any major decisions in August, we did get 95 non-major decisions issued, and nine, just, just uh, nearly 92% of those were within uh, the, the agreed uh, timeframes. 
So you'll see I've put the 24 month average figure in there. We're sort of doing pretty well generally in, in terms of our performance there. It's on an upward trend. Um, so yeah, just to, just, just so you can see where we are on those. Um, so well, I don't know if members have any questions on performance. I'm happy to receive anything else. Anything on jet support? <laughs> <laughs> How well do you know him, Madam Chairman? <laughs> oh dear. I'll rephrase that. <laughs> the mind boggles, Madam Chairman. <laughs> anyway. Oh dear, oh dear. Anyway, uh, no, no questions then. We'll now go on. Back Move, in the room. <laughs> moving swiftly on. I've also attached um, at the end of the performance section an update on where we are in the section 106 obligations. So the list is looking, I hopefully you agree, it's pretty healthy. We've got, um, okay, well, I can let Fiona speak to that one. Fiona wants to update on that one. Yeah, no, the, um, we, we've completed um, the matter on CMARGE, West Raynham, so effectively, um, and, and also there's a revised draft out on the Scotto Enterprise Park, um, which um, Hethel, the uh, lessee, is happy to sign. And in fact, Swift Air, um, although they don't have an interest in the airstrip at the moment, have, have found it acceptable. So we're just waiting for two other parties um, to confirm whether they're happy, and then that can be signed off. So, um, and then the other three, of course, unfortunately, sh uh, shaded at the top, are all subject to the nitrate neutrality issues. Thank you, Fiona. And I know you have a lot of work on these. You're down as East Law's officer for the whole of these. So, um, well done. Thanks for that. Do you want to go? Okay, moving swiftly on. We have the uh, appeals section, agenda item 11. We, we shall feel quite lost when one of these appeals goes away. And this. Uh, which has been sort of like a a permanent part of our um part of not a plot but part of our agendas anyway chair yeah there's not been a lot of um decisions on the inspectorate shall we say in the last few uh weeks we've been waiting for quite a number of cases and we uh, hence not a lot of uh decisions to to report um but I'm happy to take any questions on any particular cases if you wanted to ask about anything. I mean, you, you'll see at the end we've had two two cases decided, and, and in fact they weren't necessarily direct decisions from the inspectorate. One of the cases at Hampton was withdrawn because the applicant has working up on another application, so he's trying to resolve it through the application process rather than through the appeal process. That's the case at Hampton and at Blakeney. This is um, a slightly frustrating case for officers because we had um, prepared our responses back to the planning inspectorate, but they subsequently decided that the act of appeal was actually out of time and they shouldn't have accepted it in the first place. So, um, yeah, a little frustrating that officers had spent time preparing their responses, but nonetheless, the appeal has now um, been turned away by PINs. I thought that was a lovely expression. I had to ask on earth it meant the appeal turned away by pins. Yes. <laughs> but it was explained to me. Anybody else got anything that they would like to query? Yes. Can we privatise the planning of the spectrum, do you think, Jeff, uh, to improve its performance? Or would that make no difference? Because it's just absolutely dire. And it doesn't get very much attention from the government either as a problem. We seem to get more and more. If you think of this, this is one, two three or four pages of uh, appeals waiting waiting for the inspectorate to um, pronounce on them. And it's getting longer and longer. I know you have, and you have. Would you like to say something? Um, it, you know, Jeff will do it. No. I mean, I, there's, no, there's no easy answer, is there? I mean. They're, they're addressing their own resourcing issues like local authorities are, and, and, and they've been having difficulty recruiting planning inspectors to, to deal with these cases. So I think the backlog is 
is partly as a result of lack of capacity at the pin side of things. Um, I mean, we're all, we're all facing that, but we're all, we're trying to keep our side of the of the bargain. But unfortunately, it doesn't always seem to stack up with pins. Um, I don't think there's a lot we can do as an authority. We can we can obviously write and express our disappointment, but that doesn't necessarily get you a decision on a, on an appeal, so you can move on with certain cases. And it's not just as it affects it; it's applicants and interested parties who want to know what's going on on a site next door that they've invested time and effort to keep track of. So it's frustrating for all of us, really. Richard, you want to say something and then Liz? I, do, I mean, I do. I mean, I can't see the situation getting better when we've just had an announcement of Treasury asking government departments to prepare cuts and, and oh, sorry, economies to service. I can't see how we're going to get more resource into the planning inspectorate in the short to medium term, sadly. There was a, um, the, was it the Treasury? Yes, we're speaking this morning on Radio 4. And, uh, mentioning again that the recommendations for uh, new rules for planning uh, and development, which caused me to have collie waffles. Oh my goodness, they keep bringing this up. Liz. Um, yesterday at ONS, we were talking about the planning review. Mm. And one of the issues that we were talking about there was the fact that people don't know what our parties and external agencies, etc. And I do wonder whether there's some mileage in us putting something out about the fact that these are delays from planning inspector, because I don't think the public understand that and they see it as as us not, you know, performing. <laughs> it's very difficult, Liz, because if we start um, having a go at the planning at, at the inspectorate, it could be seen to be mm -hmm. yeah you know that, that we are passing the buck basically mm. it is difficult i think the planning inspectors have a time frame of about six months is that so uh which we always that us with our plan i get confused with well the, the planning guarantee talks about a year period so we have six months for the local authority to make a decision and then six months for the planning inspector so an applicant should have confidence they'll, they'll know one way or the other by the end of a year we're trying to meet our side of that but the inspectorate, I mean, we've got cases that have been well over a year, it's not longer than that. So. Um, well, yes. Um, yeah. Yes, Nigel and then Victoria. Uh, yes, Madam Chairman, I'll take on what uh, Council Witherton said yesterday. We sat yesterday at the ONS and, uh, you know, we had a report on the noble efforts that the development and planning are department are doing to try and increase further performance um, and I mentioned the fact that uh, we have so many other authorities that we have to deal with and coming on top of any planning and development operation we've got the inspectorate because like you Madam Chairman I'm looking at the appeals I'm looking not at the long-standing uh, should we say situations but the new ones it seems that virtually every decision that is made no then comes back as an appeal because people don't see the reason why properly in their eyes that a decision has been made. And I noticed one of the things yesterday was about educating the public. And whilst we can't be seen to be having a go at the inspectorate, I am beginning to think there is a lot of mileage in explaining to the public quite why decisions are made to the, through our system, because I think we have to clear ourselves uh, from the uh, oncoming situation that people appear to believe is happening and i said it yesterday you make a decision on the planning application if it's no they're going to get the shackles up they don't look at the situation why a decision is made and the list of the ever-growing um, appeals to me um reinforces my case thank you yeah i mean before you i just say the um the problem is that uh, uh well, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. The, the fact is that if somebody's application is turned down, they have the right to go to appeal. And this is stressed because it's the democratic way in which we deal with these situations. And we are finding that more and more people are taking that route. As you so rightly said, Nigel, they either don't like or they don't understand 
why their application has been turned down or they just don't want to listen to what the officers are saying. We're all humans, we all have different ways of dealing with it. But at the moment, we have the difficulty of the planning um, inspectorate being inundated, understaffed, not able to cope for one reason or another, and more and more people saying, I don't like your decision, um, and so therefore I'm going to appeal. So we've got the two coming together and clashing. And perhaps we should look at producing something which actually explains not just to individuals, but broadly about what happens with the planning and inspectorate services. But that's not for me to make a decision about. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. Well, I've just got actually Victoria wants to speak. I don't want to create a good one today, but I think we have to do something to ease public expectations because we're getting perfect. Did you want to speak before you go? Um, uh, if you don't mind, Chairman, that's very grace, uh, gracious of you. Um, I think members uh, liken this to an apex predator, for want of a better analogy. I may find myself in the local papers for saying this. So think of the number of applications that are actually approved by this council. Our approval rating is extraordinarily high. Mm -hmm. We're in excess of 90% approvals. We see two and a half thousand applications or thereabouts a year. So thinking of that and how this goes through the process, how many of those are actually appealed? I think what we could do is we could provide you with some statistics. We could give you maybe a bit of an enhanced update on the appeals report, because what we're doing is reporting the live ones that we have. So we could maybe give you an enhanced report that tells you more of the number of cases that are affected. I'm not saying this isn't a problem. What I'm saying is it's symptomatic. Bear in mind that apex predator analogy. Where we are at the moment is a planning system that is sick and ailing. It does not have the capacity. It does not have the experienced members in the profession that are able to support it in terms of the complexities that we have to deal with right now. So the people that are feeling this are those people at the top of the food chain, the, the planning inspectorate. We are seeing planning, planning inspectors leaving the inspectorate. We're seeing the inspectorate having the same problems with the recruitment that we have as a local authority. The standards that are expected from the planning inspectorate are not changing. They still have the same performance standards for the determination of applications that are appealed under written representations, hearings, and public inquiries. Those aren't changing. Everyone is frustrated. The planning inspectorate are frustrated as well. What we need is a review, a shake-up, and investment in the planning process. That's where we are, Chairman. But what I'm saying to you is in terms of the day-to-day, -day, the footprint on our North Norfolk applications, we see it with the larger applications such as Arcady, which quite frankly is probably the worst managed appeal I've ever seen by the planning inspectorate. But we are in a situation where those issues are becoming more frequent because of the capacities and resourcing issues that the planning inspectorate are actually having to deal with. So what I'm trying to say is that this is symptomatic of a planning system that's ailing and needs revision and needs change. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, you wish to go now. Anybody have any questions here? Yes, Andrew, you want to? I'm uh, so sorry, but Victoria, do you mind if we, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but just a very quick question. Um, I don't recall there being too much in the in the white paper that kicked off the the prospective reform by, by government regarding the planning inspection was it was it just that the apex predator would take care of itself with the measures or was there something more specific was there an acknowledgement that some sort of investigation or commission whatever needs to look into the planning inspector so it doesn't end up like gps in the health service 40 percent of whom wanted to retire in the next five years we're here today it, it, it's just the mechanism is falling apart, isn't it? Seems to me. I, I think, Chairman, the, the, the situation has exacerbated probably in the 18 months, two years since the white paper was issued. Uh, 
I think there were um, details within the white paper that talked about performance and improvements, and those did mention improvements and in investment within the planning inspectorate and the planning system generally. What we need is investment in the planning system, because without that, the symptom of this ailing apex predator, my analogy, no one else's, is, is actually symptomatic of the planning system that's ailing, that is struggling, as, as you know. Yes, okay. yes. That's right. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for um, Heidi's gift. Thank you, Philip. Um, yes, Victoria, thank you for being patient. No, I just I, I just wanted to say, could we have, if, I thought the future date for the RPD appeal had been set and it's not, it's not on the paper, unless you've changed it again. I think it was, um, I think it was January. January, January, wasn't yeah. It? Yeah. yeah. Could that but be put on the, been set. it hasn't been that. set. Yeah, obviously it hasn't been updated. I'll, I'll get that. Updated for the next agenda. That'll be lovely. Thank yeah. you. Anybody else? Anything? Right. Then we now go to the end of the next bit, which is exclusion of press and public and any private business. Well, there we are. Just gone half past ten. Well done, everybody. And